all of the Gospels. We've been through Revelation chapter 1 all the way up to now in Revelation 14. So, by the grace of God, uh, we've looked at so many different things. Uh, we've already looked at the seals. We've already looked at the trumpets. We've looked at all these things. And still, we are in that first generation based upon the time stamps that are there uh, which obviously fulfills exactly what Jesus was talking about. That was the important generation because what what they were uh, transitioning through and the judgments that was following the wrath of the Lamb and everything hitting at that time, it, it was never going to be that bad again as what it had been. All the blood from Abel all the way through pretty much to Jesus was going to be required of that generation. So a lot of focus, a lot of attention was put on there. So uh, we got from Revelation 1, uh, 2, and 3 where we looked at the manifestation of John in the heavens. Jesus shows up with the candlesticks and the stars. And, and then we get the letters to the seven churches. And then we have uh, Jesus showing up uh, in the heavenlies. And uh, all these things are happening, breaking the seals uh, to where we got to now. Uh, we're in Revelation chapter 12. We started... Again, looking at the revelation from the birth of Christ and the natural, not from the resurrection of Christ. So we've done that now in 12 and 13, and now we're here at 14. All right, can you, can you see that okay back there? Can you turn another light out? Because that ain't bothering me anyway. Go. All right, Revelation chapter 1 through 22 is what we're looking at. We're beginning here at Revelation chapter 14. <coughs> All right, well, let's pray. Father, we bless you. We thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to be here. I thank you for those who have a desire to know the truth and come to the knowledge of the truth. Father, everything we have hinges upon the absoluteness that your kingdom is here. And Father, we know that there have been things in our lives that have had crazy views about what the kingdom is, when it would be here, uh, how it is here now, or anything else. Father, we need clarity and revelation from you. Father, help us to understand the revelation of Jesus Christ so that we can uh, press beyond the delusions and press outside of any scheme, weapon, or device of any spirit of Antichrist that would be trying to steal the kingdom away, steal our authority and power away, and steal the absolute rule and reign of the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, we celebrate you. We rejoice and give you thanksgiving. You said if we asked, we would receive. So we receive your knowledge, wisdom, and understanding through the Holy Ghost right now in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Uh, as I said, Revelation chapter 14, uh, 144,000 uh, are here with the Lamb of God, the everlasting gospel to all nations. This is some of the keys for Revelation chapter 14. The Lamb and the 144,000. Whoa. Uh, Revelation 14, 1, I looked, and lo, a lamb stood on the Mount Sinai, and with him a hundred forty and four thousand, having his father's name written in their foreheads. Now we saw them already uh, back in Revelation chapter 7. In Revelation chapter 7, there were the four winds, the four angels who had the four winds was going to blow, and the other angel popped up from the earth, ascended, and said, hold it, wait, we have to seal all the servants of God in their forehead, twelve thousand from each tribe who had not defiled themselves with women, had not bowed the knee to, to the, the beast, had not bowed the knee uh, and had denied God and everything else. All of these are uh, characteristics of these 144,000. Now, as we said before, mankind may have lost track of the 10 tribes other than Benjamin and Judah, but God knew right where they were. He knew that there were still 12,000 scattered wherever they were who had not bowed the knee to the enemy and were still faithful to God, so much so he was willing to put his name on it. Amen? So that's important to remember. But we're still dealing with that first generation and the ones who were transitioning from the law of Moses and, and from the understanding of going through that type of an, a, a worship approach and obedience to God that would be acceptable to him pulling out of that and moving into the once-for-all sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ. It was a difficult transition for them. And as a matter of fact, uh, we understand 
by the Acts and by what we saw in the Gospels that the religious world hated it so bad uh, they did they not only killed Jesus but they were tracking the rest of them and try to kill all of them as well so it was a very difficult time that was going on so these 144,000 are not representative of all believers across the world and everything else they were very specific they're identified several times by the scripture on who they were and what they were doing. I guess I need to bring the brightness on that up too. You know? We know who these are from Revelation 7. 12,000 from each tribe of Israel marked in their foreheads before the seven trumpets blew on the land, sea, and the trees. Revelation 14, I heard a voice from heaven as the voice of many waters, the voice of great thunder. Did I skip on them? Anyway, they were virgins. They were undefiled with women. And they had come out of that um, persecutions, trials, and tribulations that were going on back then. So Revelation 14, 2, I heard a voice from heaven as the voice of many waters, the voice of the great thunder. I heard the voice of harpers harping with their harps. Sound like a pretty good party going on, right? Remember Revelation 12, that there is a celebration going on in heaven because the dragon and his angels have been cast out into the earth. Amen? The Lord has taken his great power and his reign. So we're going to look at this in Revelation 14, 3. And they sung, as it were, a new song before the throne and before the four beasts and the elders. And no man could learn that song but the 144,000 which were redeemed from the earth. Amen? So we know that these are a special 144,000, but they are relevant because they identify for us the generation of that they're still taking a part of. We know that they're impacting that because the ones that they start dealing with are those who keep the commandments of Moses and are drawing life from the blood of the Lamb, basically. So it's still in that transition period. Revelation 14, For these are they which were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. <coughs> Excuse me. These follow the Lamb wherever He goes, these were redeemed from among men, the first fruits of the God into the land. And that's my comment on the bottom. These are the first fruits, like we talked about the feast. You, you've got to take everything. God, When God sees everything, he sees it based upon his knowledge. And when he speaks, you've got to remember that those feasts were always set in the nation of Israel so that they would remember all of the significant things that God wanted them to do. And he told them to keep those feasts. Well, Jesus fulfilled those feasts. So one of those, after you have Passover and you have Feast of Unleavened Bread, you have Feast of First Fruits. And these were in that first generation. You've got to remember Pentecost is the fourth one, and it's after the Feast of First Fruits. So the disciples, we know Jesus was the first fruit, and the disciples coming after him were also part of that first fruit generation, the first ones uh, taken unto God uh, out of every kindred, tribe, people, and tongue, and everything else. So they were redeemed from among men, the first fruits unto God and unto the Lamb. Once again, these are the transitionary redeemed 12,000 of each 12 tribes of Israel that came out of the last generation that would end in 70 AD. First fruit virgins, first born to God and to the Lamb. Redeemed from among men. Now, it's important that you get that established in your head because these guys pop up and there's a lot of things going on. If there's anything that will help in the revelation, the first thing is don't get caught up on all the smoke and mirrors that's going on. I call them intentional stumbling blocks. Russell Wachey, years ago, uh, had talked to me. He said, he said, have you noticed the intentional stumbling blocks put in Scripture? And, and there are a lot of them. But when I got in the revelation, it was filled with them. Because it doesn't matter how God does something. It depends on when and where God does something. Are you with me? If he uses a horse with a tail like a scorpion and, and the ones riding on it have heads like lions and they got long beards, it, it doesn't matter what they look like. What are they doing? Who are they doing it to and where are they doing it? Are you with me? That's the key where you find the time stamps is don't get caught up trying to identify who the people on the horse are because more than likely 
They are spiritual entities that are having an earthly impact and an earthly manifestation because those are entities that are there. I, I've read some of the stuff over the years where they keep trying to tie them into the Persians and they tie them into uh, some of these that's going to be coming in the 2020, whenever it is, or whatever. And, uh, it's just ridiculous that they spend all this time because God will step right in the midst of all the insanity and give you a time stamp. Boom. Like the everlasting gospel coming, which is in Revelation 14, where the angels fly through heaven with the everlasting gospel to give so that all the nations can get it. We know when that happened. That everlasting gospel that was going to go out happened from Cornelius' house. Because all of the lost sheep of the house of Israel was restricted. They're the only ones who got Jesus' communications. He didn't go to the Gentiles. He told his disciples, don't go to the Gentiles. In Acts chapter 11, you hear him saying, don't go to the Gentiles. You understand what I'm saying? So all of that gives you a time stamp of realizing that the everlasting gospel would go to all the nations was unleashed when Daniel's 70th week was fulfilled at the conclusion of that 70th week, three and a half years in the body of Christ, in, in Jesus' body and three and a half years in the body of Christ, Christ working together with them, confirming the word with signs following. When that ended, then you have... Uh, Cornelius gets involved, Peter gets involved, and later Paul gets involved. But that's the everlasting gospel going to all the nations. So what I'm saying is, you get, if you get caught up trying to chase all of the symbolism, you're going to miss the official timestamps God put in those things. And if you'll hear them, you'll realize what time you're in. It doesn't matter what he's using. It matters where he's at and what he's doing. Amen? All right. Revelation 14, 5, And in their mouth was found no guile, for they are without fault before the throne of God. Still 144,000. I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having, here it is, the everlasting gospel to preach. Amen? You think they just wrote it? You, or you think they're still waiting to, to write that thing? The, the angel has it for it to go to the nation. And that's what God has done, is delivered. The angel is that angelos, which is a messenger, which that gospel now is going to go to the nation. Before it was just the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Now we have a time stamp, the angels declaring, it's going to all the nations now where before it hadn't done that. So they, uh, the angel had the everlasting gospel to preach to them that dwell on earth. So we know it starts, everything starts with God. It was in the heavenlies, but it's coming into the earthly to preach to who? Every nation, every kindred, tongue, and people never been done before but now it is and since it is the declaration has been made the gospel has been revealed the gospel of the kingdom of course so we know we are in that generation from 31 AD probably around 35 AD when Peter was given the dream of the net coming down the same time Cornelius is having the dream to go find Peter and at the same time Paul's getting knocked off his donkey and God's preparing him to go to the Gentiles Amen? Hallelujah. So this everlasting gospel to preach is a time stamp of letting you know that when it was to be preached to them that dwell on the earth. And that's where we are. <coughs> Many major events happening at one time. I just shared some of that. Acts 8 through 10. Cornelius had a dream about Peter to send for him. Peter gets a vision about God's cleanse. Uh, was told to go to Cornelius' house. Uh, God informs uh, Ananias about Paul. These are out of order in hell. Paul gets knocked off his donkey by God as God introduces himself to Paul. God informs Ananias about Paul, has the discussion with, with Ananias. God does. Ananias says, you know, he's killing people, Lord. He's, he's got all this stuff. You know, matter of fact, he's allowed to come here and do that. God says, don't you worry about it. Amen. How many of you better be here from God? <laughs> when you're going up against what they were going through at that particular because they would just deliver men uh, before the Roman things, say they're guilty, and they get them crucified. Uh, and then God sent Ananias to Paul at Antioch. Same time, uh, Paul was saved, healed, baptized in the Holy Ghost, and then he was sent to the Gentiles and to Israel. And meanwhile, Peter shows up at Cornelius' house with a team of uh, believers from Jerusalem 
and the gospel goes to the Gentile, Cornelius' house. They are all saved, baptized in the Holy Ghost. Then they are baptized in water against the Jerusalem king's wishes. Amen? Which is more important, water or the Spirit? Of course the Spirit is. So, And that's what Peter finally got around to telling him. He said, how can I forbid him water when God filled with the Holy Ghost the same as he did us? All of this is around that declaration of Revelation 14, 5, that angels having the everlasting gospel to be preached to all the nations. So they were never commissioned to go to all the nations until after that they had fulfilled the Daniel 70th week because God had to confirm the covenant for seven years. And he did it three and a half under Jesus and three and a half under the church. And the other interpretation of the Revelation and the book of Daniel says that that's not Christ, that's Antichrist, and it's stuck at the end of whenever things wind up according to them. They don't know, but it's going to happen sometime that all of these things, what we've been covering, they think still hasn't even happened yet. They're still thinking all this is going to come out there somewhere. But they take that 70th week or last seven years and say Christ, that Christ ended in the 69th week at the cross and that the 70th week was was removed, although there's no justification in Scripture anywhere to do any of that. Uh, it's it's mind-boggling. And the other marked event for a time stamp here is that Daniel 70 weeks are over. 35 AD. That's the only time the gospel could go to the Gentiles. So the Gentiles included every nation pretty much that wasn't of Israel. They were all of the nations that had across the earth. So we had the angel make the announcement, the everlasting gospel is now available to go to all the nations, all the kindreds, all the tongues, all the people. We're not waiting for that to happen. If what they teach is correct, then this hasn't even happened yet. We're waiting for the gospel to be commissioned to go to all the nations. Just something to think about. Quick peek at Acts real quick. Acts 9, 13, Ananias answered the Lord, and the Lord said, Lord, I've heard by many of this Man, how much evil he's done to the saints at Jerusalem, which confirms what we've been looking at already at the persecutions and all the things going on. 914, here he is authority from the chief priest, which actually you'll find out is the lamb with two horns, who was the second beast of Revelation 13, and spake like a dragon. And then later in Revelation 15, it literally calls that same beast the false prophet which ties that religious thing in there. Never been called the false prophet. You don't hear about the false prophet until it shows up that there are three frogs or three evil spirits coming out of the dragon, uh, out of uh, the beast Rome, and out of the false prophet. And that false prophet leads back to uh, the second beast of Revelation 13. Are you confused yet? Uh, you're with me. All right. In any case, here he has authority from the chief priest to bind all that call on the name of Jesus. This is the work of the two-horned lamb that spoke like a dragon. Exactly. I mentioned earlier that Saul or Paul was once working with them. And he was. He was going out, and I think that was Paul's toughest thing to get over, was he actually didn't just persecute Christ. He had followers of Christ put to death. I mean, that's a little bit tough to get over right there. Acts 9, 15, the Lord said unto him, Go thy way, for he's a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. God converts one from the dragon beast and the two-horned lamb beast king. Amen. God just reaches right there and takes Paul, who is, is kind of the, like Clyde would say, the cat that's running with the football. And God says, I, I'm drafting you. You're going to be running with me now. And within three or four days, after he gets his sight back, when Ananias shows up, he's in the synagogues teaching Jesus. Pretty phenomenal. That's what the Holy Ghost will do to you when he opens it, takes that veil away. Acts 10, 36, the word which God sent to the children of Israel, preaching peace by Jesus Christ. He is Lord of all. That word I say you know, which was published throughout all Judea and began from Galilee after the baptism which John preached, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost with power and went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. And we are witnesses of all things which he did both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem, who they slew and hanged on a tree. 
Him God raised up the third day and showed him openly, not to all the people, but unto witnesses chosen before of God, even to us who did eat and drink with him after he rose from the dead, after he commanded us to preach unto the people and to testify that it is he which was ordained of God to be the judge of the quick and the dead. <coughs> to him give all the prophets witness that through his name, whosoever believes in him shall receive remission of sin. And while Peter yet spake these words, he's at Cornelius' house, the Holy Ghost fell on all them which heard the word. Amen? Now think about it. He didn't say, oh, Holy Ghost of God, please come and fill us, Lord, settle down. He just to give them the word, and God says, I got this. Boom. And it just shows up and fills them all. Now, when I was ministering in Batavia, Ohio, back around 91 or 92, that's exactly what happened. 300 people in a Baptist church, and I was instructed by the pastor and his wife, don't teach on the Holy Ghost. And I said, I'm just going to obey God, whatever. And they said, well, we don't believe in all that. I said, well, okay, that's fine. So I get up, and I don't teach on the Holy Ghost, but I do share a few things from the Spirit what the Spirit was saying. And I told you, amazingly enough, the first one to get filled with the Holy Ghost and speak in tongues was the pastor's wife. And she came out of the third row on the left side of the wall. She came right out in the middle of the floor. And it was like she just drugged others with her because when she got it, they just started getting it everywhere. And about 295 of them had got it just like that. Nobody prayed for anybody. He just fell. Amen. And I, so I've seen it. I've seen that happen in Barbara and it was Baptist again, believe it or not. And, they, and God said, just have them hold hands. I'm going to, uh, they, they wanted to hold hands. And God said, tell them to put their hands down. I'm going to walk in the midst of them. And I said, okay. Because they're all standing there like this, about 15. And I said, God said, just drop your hands down. He's going to walk in our midst. And no sooner had, had, I, had I said that, I heard thump, thump, thump. And I look, and these Baptists who don't know how to fall correctly, <laughs> They've not been trained properly. They're just crumpling on the floor. Boom, 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 boom. And I look, and all of them just crumple on the floor. And I'm standing there. <coughs> then all of a sudden, I hear the Spirit speaking. I hear tongues starting to come forth. And the next thing you know, everybody in that place got filled with the Holy Ghost. Nobody prayed for nobody. The Holy Ghost just did it. There was one that didn't get it. And they were weeping and crying because they thought they'd done something wrong and God didn't love them and everything else. And I prayed, and the Lord said to tell them to, to be at peace, that all was well. And that's all I could say was whatever he said to say. So, I mean, I, we started praying. To uh, I got there at 7, did a little Bible study, and, and there, there was a whole event where the guy came in with a gun. He's going to go kill somebody. Holy Ghost fell on him. He got saved. He gave his gun up. I mean, there's... The crazy stuff happens when you get out there ministering the gospel of the kingdom. But in any case, by about 9 o'clock, we were ready to leave. Everybody was, that's when we were going to pray. And it was, I didn't leave there until after midnight, after the Holy Ghost. Stuff. And they didn't know what happened to them. They were told that was the devil, and it didn't happen. And, uh, of course, um, it wasn't the devil. It was God. But that last one the time I got home, they had already called my house and said they got filled with the Spirit before I got to the house. So, I mean... God does that. That's what happened at Cornelius' house. It's just the Holy Spirit. And he's still the same today as he was all the other times. Amen? So when this happens, we know that God has, has moved the focus of only being with the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Now, he not only sends Peter to go there and gives Peter a vision to equip him, what I call, what I cleanse, don't call common or unclean, he, he doesn't just send Peter. He sends the Holy Ghost. And the Holy Ghost just fills them all. Amen? So, here in Revelation chapter 14, I believe it's verse 5, we're seeing that everlasting gospel that went across was again a confirmation that it was the end of Daniel's 70 weeks. It was the end of the confirmation of the seven years for the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Even Paul said, it was necessary that the gospel be preached to you first and then to the rest. So we're looking at that same time frame of when all that stuff was, was coming to a close. Acts 13, 46, Paul and Barnabas waxed bold 
said it was necessary, here it is, it was necessary that the word of God should first have been spoken to you, uh, Acts 13, 46, but seeing you put it from you and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, we're going to the Gentiles. Amen? So it's another confirmation of what you're seeing in the Revelation. If you let the Scripture identify the timestamps that you're seeing in the Revelation, you can't help but get it right. Amen? It's when we start trying to read into it what they're telling us we should be seeing that isn't there, like an Antichrist and like a rapture and like a seven-year tribulation and, and a covenant being made between this evil Antichrist and God's the one doing all this stuff. This is God. This is our Father. Amen? Same with the loud voice, Revelation 14, 7. Fear God, give glory to Him, for the hour of His judgment has come. Worship Him that made heaven, earth, the sea, and the fountains of water. So the hour of His judgment has come. There's only one place in all of Scripture that I've located that there was an hour of judgment coming up. Only one place. It was the hour of judgment. And it was on Babylon. And Babylon was, I'm not talking about Nebuchadnezzar's Babylon, I'm talking about Jerusalem Babylon. Are you with me? No, I, I, believe me, I'll back up what I'm saying. Revelation 14 said, For the hour of his judgment has come. The hour of judgment is on Jerusalem. Revelation 18.10 points this out. I know it's, it's further than we are, but we need to bring that in so you can see, just to solidify Alas, alas, that great city Babylon, that mighty city, for in one hour is thy judgment come. Not only does that confirm the, the time strength, the hour of judgment being on Jerusalem as spiritual Babylon is important. <coughs> Seeing that the city Babylon ceased to exist 400 years earlier, we have biblical facts that point to Jerusalem. And we're going to look at that because Babylon is a key figure that's coming up. In, in some of the other chapters. We need to get that locked in. We're going to do that real quick. Jerusalem and spiritual Babylon is important. Peter the Apostle and Elder at Jerusalem addresses his home church as being in Babylon. He's 1 Peter 5.13, the church that is at Babylon. And he was at Jerusalem. Elected together with you, salute you. Amen. And even included his son Mark who was living with him there at Jerusalem. So, I mean, that's one uh, point that brings out Babylon. But Luke 11, 47 also says, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, for you build the sepulchres of the prophets, and your fathers kill them. Truly you bear witness that you allow the deeds of your fathers, for they indeed killed them, and you build their sepulchres. So they were allowing the deeds of their fathers. Therefore also, verse 49 said, the wisdom of God, I will send them prophets and apostles, and some of them shall they slay and persecute, that the blood of all the prophets which was shed from the foundation of the world may be required of this generation. From the blood of Abel unto the blood of Zacharias, which bears between the altar and the temple, verily I say unto you, it shall be required of this generation. Amen? So when's all that blood going to be required? In that generation. Alright? Matthew 23, 32. Fill you up then the measures of your fathers. Do you know who he's talking to? Scribes and Pharisees. He's talking to the religious rulers in Jerusalem. That's who he's talking to. And he's telling them, fill you up the measure of your fathers. So he's saying that that requirement is going to be in this generation, but it's also going to be upon them, and they solidified that. Matthew 23, 33. You serpents... You generation of vipers, how can you escape the damnation of hell? Now, if you talk to a Jew like that today, they'd lynch you. They'd tar and feather you. Because they, they have them up there, but how many knows it's not the natural born, it's the spiritual born. Mm -hmm. that's, that's the way that Paul even identified. Matthew 23, 34. Wherefore, behold, I send unto you prophets and wise men and scribes, some of them you'll kill and crucify. Some of them shall you scourge in your synagogues and persecute them from city to city. Then upon you. So it's not just it'll be on this generation. But now he's saying that upon you may come all the righteous blood shed upon the earth. Amen. So we got two important things. All of the blood from Abel forward was going to be 
not only on that generation, but it was also going to be on them in Jerusalem. Matthew 23, 36. Verily I say unto you, all these things shall come upon this generation. So we have a double witness <coughs> to give a double time stamp. Who it was going to be, where it was going to be, and, that, and for that generation to be in existence, the latest it could possibly be was 70 A.D. Because Jesus spoke this around 30, 31 A.D. Amen? Now this is important because if you can anchor in what God is saying, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kind of drive the nail home with that in Revelation 18 here in just a second. But I, I want to back up just... What does he say here in 2335? That upon you may come how much of the righteous blood? All of it. Now what does that leave out? It doesn't leave any. If it's all, it's all. Amen. Or I think he would have or some he would have said some of the blood. No, he said all of it. Now that's vitally important because they'll argue till they're blue in the face that that wasn't the case. Then he immediately says, Oh Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that kills the prophets and stones them which are sent unto you. Then he goes on actually and says, How long I, I stood all day and, and stretched my arms out to you and I gathered you in as a mother hand with a chick, but you wouldn't let me. Behold, your house is left unto you desolate. So all the righteous blood shed upon the earth required of Jerusalem and required in that generation. Now that's key. If, if you write anything down, you can put that on your refrigerator, maybe put it, you know, on your mirror in the bathroom. Something where you can, can get that because these these are irrefutable facts. Irrefutable. It can't can't be thrown anywhere else. All righteous blood shed upon the earth, apostles, prophets, messengers, righteous. When we find this blood, we find Jerusalem. Amen. Based on what we saw, if you if you have the blood of the apostles, prophets, and the righteous shed on the earth, all of it. Is going to be in that generation and going to be shed by them in, in Jerusalem. When you find the blood, you found Jerusalem. Right? We find it in Babylon. Revelation 18, 9, Babylon. For in one hour, again, the hour of judgment, is she made what? Desolate, which Jesus said was going to happen. Jerusalem, Matthew 23, 38. Behold, your house is left unto you desolate. Revelation 18, 20. Babylon, rejoice over her, thou heaven, and you holy apostles and prophets. For God has avenged you on her. Amen. Let's go on. Revelation 18, 24. And in her was found the blood of prophets and of saints and of all that were slain upon the earth. Now where is the blood found? In Babylon. And if it's found in Babylon in 18, and God said all the blood of the prophets and the saints and the righteous would be there upon them, then you know who Babylon is. There was no Babylon city in existence. It was spiritual Babylon, the same one Peter labeled it in 1 Peter in chapter 5. Same thing. This is Jerusalem. Matthew 23, 35, that upon you may come all the righteous blood shed upon the earth. There is no doubt that spiritual Babylon is Jerusalem for God line. It has to be that solid in your mind that Babylon is Jerusalem with a spiritual name because if, the, if all the blood of the prophets and the saints and all of them shed upon the earth, the righteous ones was going to be required of that generation and upon them people in that city, the leaders of the uh, temple in Jerusalem, then it has to be Jerusalem. Amen? Amen. <coughs> and since the blood was found in Babylon, it's got to be. What would God be lying about? All righteous blood shed upon the earth being required of that generation and in Jerusalem. Think about it. If, if this isn't supposed to be fulfilled until still down the road somewhere, then God's still lying. Because he said it would be that generation, amen, and it would be that city. 
Did God say that the blood of all righteous and apostles and prophets were required in Jerusalem and in that generation? Absolutely. Then would requiring it of a Babylon 2,000 plus years later be a lie? Absolutely. Had to be Jerusalem and in that generation. So that's that's how anchoring those time stamps are when you realize we're in Revelation chapter 18 and he's still talking about the blood of the prophets and the saints and the righteous being found in Babylon. Then when they when they uprooted her and dug her up, there was the blood of the righteous. So we know it was Jerusalem. And the only time that's happened was 70 AD. 66 to 70 AD. So God didn't leave an alternative. He didn't say maybe, or he'd try to do it. He said it would. Revelation 14, 7 is another time stamp. It has to be within that generation, 31 to 70 AD. There is no doubt that spiritual Babylon is Jerusalem, back to Revelation 14 is. And there followed another angel saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Okay, it's fallen. Is an angel in heaven is voicing it. Jerusalem had fallen from its heavenly state. Remember, we had rejoicing going on in the heavens. People might think that was the earth, but it was the heavens. Why? Because the devil got cast out. Oh, sorry about you guys. Woe to you guys. But we're having it good up here now. I mean, you have to see both aspects of that in the revelation because if you don't, you'll get tangled up and think everything just happened in the earth. There's stuff going on in the heavens and things going on in the earth. So the angel in heaven was voicing it. Jerusalem had fallen from its heavenly estate, which means what? No longer favored, no longer protected. Amen? Now you'll see as you go through the revelation where the actual fall occurs, and then the angel says, come and I'll show you the judgment of that prostitute or that poor in Babylon. <coughs> Revelation 14, 9, the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast in his image and receive his mark and the forehead or in his hand, see, we've got another time stamp. We know when that is. We know that that is that tumultuous time that was taking place, but probably starting in 54 AD and at the reign of Nero, all the way through the destruction in 70 AD. But you can't, you can't just say probably. We know it's in that generation, so it has to be from 31 A.D. to 70 A.D. We've not got out of there. That was a very important time in the history of the world, in the history of mankind, because God was uprooting something he'd used for 2,500 years, and I'm not doing it anymore. That's what he said. I'm not doing it anymore. I'm getting over it. I'm done. But the ones representing it right now, they, they appear to be lambs, but they're not. They're wolves. They're, they're not serving me. They're serving the dragon. And, and they didn't just not honor the ones I sent. They killed my son. The one who came and said everything. I mean, there's a lot going on. And now that his son had returned, his son sent them out. And they're still trying to track them down and kill them. And God says, enough. That's it. Are you with me? Yeah. It's a big event. It, that's the biggest thing that could ever happen in stuff that's coming out here somewhere. I guarantee you. It, it wouldn't matter. China took over the world. It would be nothing compared what happened back then. You know why? Because the kingdom of God is still here. And the authority and the power in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ is still here. And I'm going to tell you when the body of Christ wakes up to it, all of that stupid stuff out there is over. It's over. Oh. <coughs> Revelation 14, 10, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God. Now think about that. And if you bow the knee, if you've done this, you're going to drink of the wrath. Well, wait a second. You know what that tells me? The wrath hasn't come yet. That, that's saying we're still in that generation. But he said, if you bow the knee, you'll drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation, and he shall be tormented with fire, shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and the presence of the Lamb. So we're still looking. you got to remember, in our Heavenly Father and His love, and you'll find it, we're going to find more of it, even between here and in chapter 18, you're going to find God still trying to bring repentance. In the last seven plagues, He's still 
saying they repented not, which is in the mind of God. Surely they'll repent. No, they blasphemed God and cursed the works of God's hands. They would not repent. So this is still God reaching out in his love, trying to increase the number of that remnant. Revelation 14, 11, the smoke of their torment ascended up forever and ever. And they have no rest day or night, no, nor who worship the beast and his image, and whosoever receives the mark of his name. Amen. We know that was the Roman kingdom. We know that was the fourth kingdom of Daniel. We know that that's what God was saying was happening. We know that that is the beast that the dragon gave its authority and power to. We know that the, the second beast of Revelation 13, the lamb with the two horns, the spake like a dragon, was getting all of its support from the beast. Amen? <coughs> Revelation 14, 9 through 11 is a time stamp. Persecutions, times of tribulation during the mark or bowing to his image that occurred in 35 to 70 AD. It's in that generation. It has to be. This is pre-wrath of God, O Jerusalem, which was shown, as I pointed out, in Revelation 14, 10. Revelation 14, 12. Here's the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. So we're looking at those who are still are, have been raised up and, and have honored the traditions that Moses passed on to them, but now they have come into the revelation of the Lamb. That's the transition generation that saw the switch from the Old Testament into the New, from the Old Covenant to the New Covenant. They still thought the Old Covenant was viable because the temple was still standing. But God, said, God through Jesus, has already prophesied and said, that ain't going to be there for long. Amen? All the comments they want to put to the future in Matthew chapter 24 was Jesus telling him when he was talking about there wasn't going to be one stone left upon another. When would these things be? And what would be the sign of the coming? And that's what he was telling them. But they want to put that out here to some restored Roman Empire and all this other stuff. It's ridiculous. But here, <coughs> the patience of the saints, those who patiently endure patiently awake, cling to the truth, trust in the Holy Ghost, trust in the guidance of the Lord Jesus Christ to get them through. They're the ones that are enduring all of these things. And even Jesus in the letters to the church has said, hold fast that you have till I come. I'm coming quickly. Amen. Revelation 14, 13. And I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, right, blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth. Why? What is the difference from someone who used to die in the Lord and then somebody who dies in Christ. Somebody who dies in the Lord had to wait until Christ came and restored all things back to the Father. So we have another time step. When did Jesus restore everything back? His death, burial, and resurrection. Amen? And the time following, we know that's when that restoration was made. So everyone, Paul even said, that to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. What I would choose, what would be best for me, I'm not going to choose. I'll stay here and try to bring you into the knowledge of the truth. But if he said that if it was left up to me, I'd go on and be with the Lord. And that's exactly what that's saying. Blessed are those who die in the Lord. It's not like you're going to get a special trophy. There's no line anymore. You're not waiting for anything. Amen? <coughs> Why? It indicates that the new covenant to everyone is in effect. Agreed with Revelation 14, 6, the everlasting gospel. So we're still in Revelation 14. Here comes the everlasting gospel. All of these things are happening. The, the 144,000 show up. Things are going on. And, and all of a sudden, here it comes. And he says, another proclamation. Blessed are those who die in the Lord from this time forward. Why? Because the new covenant has reconciled you to the Father. You're not going to wait somewhere in paradise or some other place uh, waiting for the manifestation to come. Kind of like in Revelation chapter 6, seal number 5, you had the saints that were waiting under the altar. And they said, how long, Lord? And they said, well, till them who like you uh, for the word of their testimony and, and basically for the Lord are going to have to lose their lives as well. They were waiting. And what this proclamation says... No more waiting. Amen? When you 
accept Jesus Christ, you are sealed with the Holy Ghost, and you will be kept there, and when you are redeemed out of there, you go straight into the heavenlies. You're not waiting anywhere, anywhere else. As a matter of fact, before you, before death can ever get a hold of who you are, God translates you out of that. You lose your earthly consciousness, but you are very much into your heavenly consciousness. Amen? That's exactly what he said. You will not taste death. Death has no power over you. Amen? Now, it can affect the body, but it can't affect you. So that, that's what's going on in Revelation in chapter 14 and verses 9 through 11. Why? Because there is no more delay to be absent from the body to be present with the Lord. How are we doing on time? Anybody know? This also signifies the old, the end of the old covenant. Hallelujah. Amen. God was not running to like this. He was the old is going down and the new is being released and engaged. So as soon as you hear the everlasting gospel coming, all of a sudden you start hearing uh, something else. So we should we should be getting information very quickly in this chapter of something that's happened. So the old covenant was fading away. It's to be extracted from the earth with the righteous that were in it. Amen? Boom. So the unrighteous has their place and the righteous has their place. So if since that whole economy of approach to God and reward to God and doing things pleasing to God has ended... God is not slack concerning His promises. He'll move on. Amen? That's exactly what happened. Revelation 14, 14, And I looked, and behold, a white cloud, and upon the cloud one set like unto the Son of Man. He's on this thing already. And He says, Having on His head a golden crown, and in His hand a sharp sickle. Amen? Revelation 14, 15. And another angel came out of the temple crying with a loud voice to him that sat on the cloud, Thrust in thy sickle and reap, for the time has come for thee to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. Amen? That is no rapture at the end. He's winding up the old, and he's had all those unrighteous and righteous who died under that old economy now open the books and give account. Because the only way you could have been righteous then was to believe the report God gave of His coming Son or God had decided that your works were worthy enough that He attributed it to you for righteousness. You, you had what they uh, call imputed righteousness, but you yourself could not have been born righteous because Christ hadn't been given. You see, God provided something for us that none of them had. All of them who, in my book, is a million times more deserving than me, the Davids and the and the Rebecca or uh, uh, the uh, Isaiahs and Jeremiahs and everybody, Daniels, all of them more worthy than I could ever imagine that we'd ever be. But God still chose to give us a better covenant with better promises and seal us with the Holy Ghost while we were still here. It's incredible. So here we have now, we know even before this showed up, we saw boom, the old was coming to an end and sure enough, immediately immediately thrust in your sickle for the, it's time to reap this thing. Look what he says. This confirms that the old covenant is over. This is the reaping of the unrighteous dead and the righteous dead under that system. No more waiting for them either like those in Revelation chapter 6 and 5 like I said earlier. Previously, we had seen the righteous resurrected that were under the times of persecution and tribulation of those 10 years or so. You'll see them pop up in that first section to where it says these come out of tribulation. These come out of great persecution. It wasn't everybody else. When you were included in that, they called it the first resurrection. And the rest of the dead didn't live when you get back in Revelation 18, 19, 20 until that uh, period of time of the thousand year reign was up. So there are those who were all the way back to the, uh, that it was previous to the Mosaic economy. Uh, you got to remember, it, it didn't start with Abel. It didn't start with Seth. It didn't start with Noah. It didn't even start with Abraham. I mean, the, that Mosaic economy, I mean, the promise started with Abraham or Abram at the time, but Abram, Isaac didn't get it. Uh, uh, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob had it, 
And they had the promise, and the law was only added according to the promise. So everybody before him, Enoch, Noah, all of them, none of those were included in that Mosaic economy. Are you with me? Or even the promise of, in that economy. So previously we had all of those who come out of that generation. Jesus was dealing with them first. And that's exactly what they, they were rewarded first. We are, remember he said the last shall be first and the first shall be last. That's what he's talking about. Abel and all them will come last, although they were first. But these who were last at, at that particular time were the ones who endured the most. <coughs> Excuse me. So we're seeing, uh, previously we had seen that, but now we're seeing of the 12 tribes of Israel, the unrighteous and the righteous. Joel chapter 3 and verse 12. Let the heathen be wakened. Amen. He didn't say Gentiles. Talk about the heathen. The heathen who? Of the 12 tribes of Israel. Let the heathen be wakened and come up to the valley of Jehoshaphat, for there will I sit to judge all the heathen round about. We see that in Daniel chapter 7. Uh, where the ancient of days sit and, and thrones were set down. Joel 3.13 Put you in the sickle for the harvest is ripe. Come get you down for the press is full the fats overflow for their wickedness is great. Amen. So who's been taken here in this thing? The wicked. The heathen. Amen. Who did Jesus say would be taken first? The wicked and the heathen. Now this other system, they say the righteous will be taken first. That it's a rapture and the righteous will be taken out. Then the wicked will be dealt with. No, that's not what the scripture says. As a matter of fact, uh, we're going to look at that. But here, even Joel said, nah, it don't work that way. These are the wicked and righteous, heathen dead of the twelve tribes of Israel. Wake them up. Bring them to be judged. Use the sickle. The harvest is right. Amen. Do you know why they're harvesting? Because the economy is over. The old covenant is over. Now, that that old covenant was focused around Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and his 12 children. And the 12 children give birth to the 12 nations. So, all of that's dealing with that. Whoa, what are you saying? The sun and the moon shall be darkened. Sound familiar? This is still Joel, chapter 3, verse 15. The stars shall withdraw their sun shining. And the Lord also shall roar out of Zion. Where have we come to? Not Mount Sinai. Hebrews tells us you come to Mount Zion. To the city of the living God. Amen. To the heavenly Jerusalem. To the spirits of just men made perfect. Job 3.16. And utter his voice from Jerusalem. And the heavens and the earth shall shake. The Lord will be the hope of his people and the strength of the children of Israel. Why? Because the wicked are being dealt with, just like Jesus told them, be on alert, watch out, don't be sleeping. When I come, I'm coming to wipe some, some bad guys out, and I need you to get out of the way. I need you to go where I told you to go. Just like on the, uh, in Egypt with the death of the firstborn, he told them, yes, put the blood on the doorpost and the lintel, but stay in the house. It's the same thing. The Lord said, be where I tell you to be at, and that's what he's saying here in Joel in chapter 3 and verse 16. He said, the Lord will be the hope of his people and the strength of the children of Israel. What? When, when he's uttering his voice and the heavens and the earth are shaking, God's taking care of business. Matthew 13, 37. He answered and said to them, he that sows the good seed is the son of man, the fields of the world, the good seed of the children of the kingdom. You'll see how it fits. The enemy that sowed them is the devil. That's the wicked. That's the one that we're talking about. The harvest is in the end of the world. When is it? The end of the world. When is the end of the world? It's already come. Hallelujah. Now that'll blow. They go, how can you say the end of the world is come? We're still here. Because your world and the world God talks about are different worlds. Amen. They're talking about the end of planet Earth and the end of mankind. We know it. God was talking about that world system that had been uh, set up, that the enemy was running, that God had formulated the old covenant to uh, protect and keep his people, his people safe, 
in that time until the seed to whom the promises were made came. And he did come. Amen? And when he did, that old system now is out of the way. The, the effects that it had in the earth, out of the way. The, th the effects that it was working in the heavens, out of the way. Jesus said, I don't come to, to just wipe them out. I come to fulfill them. I come to fill them up to complete them. Amen? So the enemy that sowed them, the devil, the harvest is the end of the world, and the reapers are the angels. The end of the world was in the days of the generation of Christ. I, I give a little bit on that just so that we'll have it in our teaching. As spoken about by Paul, Peter, and John. Hebrews 9, 26. For then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world. But now, when? Now, now once in the end of the world. How many believe? I, I mean, I've said it a lot. But it will blow your mind how much the Scripture interprets the Scripture. But now, once, in the end of the world, what? What the end of the world? Has He appeared? Who appeared? Jesus did. What did He do? He put away sin by the sacrifice of Himself. So when was this end of the world? Way back then. It's confirmed by the Scripture. Are you with me? Now once in the end of the world has he appeared and put away sin, not the sacrifice of himself. And as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this, the judgment. And, and that's what I'm saying, that everything changed. There's no more holy and open the books up. There's one book now, it's the book of life. If you're in the book of life, you have life. If you're not, you have the lake. It's that simple. You decide your own judgment before you leave here. If you want to go it on your own, you're going to lose. If you go in Christ, you're going to win. It's that simple. There, there is no alternative. It's not like, well, I don't know, Lord, or Clyde said this, and I don't know. You know none of that will work. If, if, if you're His, you have life. If you're not, and Adam all die, in Christ everyone's made alive. Amen? And that's what he's saying. There was Before that, there was, all the, there was even a, a dispute between Satan and and Michael over the body of Moses. You read that in the book of Jude. And, and, and why that was is because there was a lot of discussion. But now, God says, glorify me in your body and your spirit that are already mine. Amen? Amen. So now we present our bodies as a living sacrifice unto God. 1 Peter 4, 5. Who shall give account to him that is ready to judge the quick and the dead... For, for this cause was the gospel preached also to them that are dead. That's all we've talked about so far on these people that are going up except the ones who were sealed. The ones who were sealed were alive. That's why they had to wait. But the ones who are dead are the ones we're watching passing into the heavenlies. There's nobody taking out this living realm. You were sealed here, but you live out your, your lifespan here. And when you leave here, then you fall into the heavenly category. Amen? Although we are seated in heavenly now and your spirit being actually existing in heaven having an earthly manifestation but God's not rapturing you out of here to get you out of bad times. He's sending you in the middle of bad times so that you can redeem the times because the days are evil. 1 Peter 4, 6 They might be judged according to men in the flesh but live according to God in the spirit. Amen. I'll try to get to this point and then uh, I guess I should. First Peter 4 said, but the end of all things is at hand. Now he wrote that around 49 to 50 AD. He knew it. Uh, Paul knew it. John knew it. They had no problem with it. The only ones that had a problem with it seemed to be the, the masterminds of today. They all think that they've got this all figured out. And the only thing that I know they've got figured out is that they need help. They need the Holy Ghost. They need wisdom and knowledge and guidance. Because if they'll accept the testimony of God and the Holy Ghost of God, then they'll get over all of this stuff trying to say God lied and God couldn't pull off setting his kingdom up and, and all these other things. I, I could not imagine standing. Well, God, you should have set your kingdom up when you said you were going to. Things would have been different if you had set your kingdom up. Can you imagine anybody being able to say that to God? He said, I got news for you there, uh, Skippy. I set my kingdom up. You missed out on it. Amen. 
Amen. Matter of fact, uh, you're in the wrong line. But the end of all things is at hand. Be ye therefore sober and watch unto prayer. 1 John 2, 18. Little children, it is the last time. And as you have heard that Antichrist shall come, even now are there many Antichrists, whereby we know that it is the last time. Amen. Many are looking for an end of planet Earth as the end of the world. The world was their current system of life. That's what was coming to an end. It already ended. Amen. Anyway, Father, I bless you. Lord, I know we didn't finish chapter uh, 15, but I was shooting for it. Father, I just pray that by your grace as we go through these things, Father, that you establish a foundation in us so that we know the truth. We're bold about the truth. We're confident knowing, Lord, that you are in control and have been in control and always will be in control. We're not afraid of some man and of Christ coming because he doesn't exist. Father, we celebrate and give you praise. We rejoice at the coming of the Christ, the Son of the living God, who now is here, who lives within our being, and we live and move and have our being in him. And Father, we thank you for the kingdom. We thank you, Father, for forgiving us our, our debts. We thank you, Lord, for giving us each day our daily bread. We thank you for keeping us from temptation. We thank you, Father, that uh, we are blessed because now, and our physical body dies in you, we're immediately transported into the heaven. <coughs> we give all praise, honor, and glory to you. Help us to be established in this truth present with us, and help us to grow up and mature in it. In Jesus' name, amen.